My name is Kevin Ferguson. I am the director of the Center for 21st Century Studies. And to begin this two and a half day conference, I would like to welcome the provost of the University of Wisconsin at Milwaukee, Johannes Britz, to say a few words. Thank you very much again, and uh, I also, just as you said, just want to welcome you all to the conference for the next two and a half days, and in particularly the uh, international visitors here, or those of you who came to this country, I won't say legally, um, and um, it's the, the part of being a provost um, is, the good part is you interact with so many things happening on a campus, apart from budgets and all the other stuff, this is the nice part because you really learn so much about what people are doing and their research. And I did read through the big no, and I told Ken I don't understand everything, uh, the narrative and all the research that people are doing, but I do know what big no means. In my office, I thought the provost office is a big no, because you just learn to say no, 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 all the time for all the requests. But it does change, as you said, the argument of landscape. And it's very intriguing to see the different topics that's going to be discussed. Um, I look at the names and the CVs of the plenary speakers that you've invited. Very, very impressive. I want to also say a word of very welcome, specifically to our plenary speakers. And apart from these conferences, I think I said that the other day to that we had another international conference here on the um, uh, Center for International Education. My comment was that it's not just what you learn academically from one another and what people are doing and the engagement, but it's also the network of, of, of more people that you meet and more research opportunities and just connections. Actually, I ended up here at UWM at one of the conferences with somebody that I met in 1998. I've never been in the U.S. and I came as a visiting professor through a conference. So I always said, you know, that's the opportunity of networking. So I end off my word of welcome. I really hope it's a fruitful conference for you. I'm very proud of the work that you do. I know there's a big no in all the budgets, but for C21 it was a yes, no, uh, in terms of continuing to support a long tradition of all the stuff that you do, Ken, and all uh, the history of uh, the uh, center um, uh, over the many, many years that really put us aside in terms of a unique uh, asset that we have on campus. Again, welcome, and I hope you have a good conference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Provost Britz, for that introduction. Um, it is true that there seems to be nothing productive about the concept of no. The naysayer, the Bartleby, the refusenik, the denier, the antagonist, the disavower, the invalidator, such people we generally presume are best avoided. No and the negative are generally regarded as synonymous. No blocks. It refuses. It declines. Rather than celebrating, consoling, or creating. We spend a lot of time in our lives trying to get to yes. But for the next day and a half we will celebrate the potential and the power of no. For no also stands against consensus, against assumption, against presumption, against the easy passage. In the words of the conference call, it, quote, emerges early and maintains its appeal and power. In cultures of capitalist consumption, no has the power to defend and upend assumptions of order and propriety. From Thoreau to Gandhi to Marcuse, the will to nothing has provided a source of individual and collective creation. Refusals dramatically reshape politics, nationhood, sovereignty, and land." Unquote. The, conference participates, the conference participants gathered here in both the plenary speeches and the breakout sessions will be exploring the potential and the promise of no. Don't presume that all no's are equivalent or exchangeable with one another in their capacities. No is illiquid, non-fungible. I'd like to lead off the conference by classifying a few different kinds of no, a set of negatives easily but inappropriately confused. I don't claim that the following typology is complete. It turns out that no constantly surprises you. But it may serve as a useful mapping of some of the gravitational centers 
of no that we are about to enter. The first sort of no, the kind that we most commonly associate with its utterance, is the no of resistance. This is the no of both the two-year-old and the revolutionary. It says simply there must be a better way. Your way is not good enough. Such a naysayer may recognize the compulsory power of the system that she or he confronts, but stands against it nonetheless. To say no as a, as a resistor is to reject the assumption that we must all get to yes, that cooperation with the system, whether it's evil, inhumane, or just plain enervating, is always and forever necessary. The space of resistance is the no of the subversive and the saboteur, those who find that the best way to use their wooden shoe is to throw it in the machine. One declines to work, to grieve, to love, to support, to acquiesce, to comply, to participate. This is the negativity of enough already. It's immediately accessible, easy, easy even, always there in a country song or a daydream. It is too often obscured by the ideologies of necessity, of adulthood, of responsibility. The no of resistance is often best prefaced by an obscenity. A second form of no can be thought of as the no of forking paths. This no is best metaphorized through the conception of the non in non-Euclidean geometry where one or more of the postulates which make up the commonly accepted premises of geometry are denied. For example, what happens when one denies the axiom that parallel lines never meet, assuming instead that they meet at infinity? One can then work through the math of manifolds and other non-homeomorphic objects. The partiality of such a no can initially seem minimal or even ir irrelevant. What is one postulate among friends, anyway? But the implications of such a no grow and expand as the consequences build on one another. The no stream flows alongside the original riverbed, often leaving it alone, and in time can become its own powerful force. At times, this non may even outweigh the source. Non-standards can fractally become standards and vice versa, of course, and can they themselves generate their own alternatives. Such a no is unlimitedly in, in institutive, self-developing, generative. It is a no which brings about an equivalent set. The third sort of no is the no of absolute refusal, of confrontational negation, of abolition. This no not only avoids participation, it points to the world that its own utterance opens up. This is the refusal of the conscientious objection, the native sovereignty, the literary dissident. In some ways, this draws from the first two forms of no, in that it rejects the status quo and it looks elsewhere. But it differs from them in that its very existence stands against the thing it opposes. To archism, it, sorry, to archism, such a naysayer posits anarchism. To consensus, dissensus. To order, laughter. Take as an example of this no, the anti-reconciler. Reconciliation demands a subsumption, a final synthesis of thesis and antithesis. But to deny reconciliation is to de deny the legitimacy of this synthetic absorption. Non-reconciliation does not stand as a problem in this case, but as a goal. The presumptions of reconciliation are that we can ultimately get over it. To live in a world of anti-reconciliation or non-reciprocality is not to reject action, politics, or meaning, but rather to insist on the alternatives of coincidence, those incidents which are obscured by the processes of, revolution, of, of resolution and of compromise. These are merely some opening thoughts. You are, of course, encouraged to reject them. In fact, I hope the next few days to be filled with such rejections of hierarchies, of orders, of self-possessions. Be uncompromised. Before doing this, however, 
please join me in thanking some of the people and institutions which made this conference possible. The College of Letters and Science provides fundamental and vital support to the center and has done so for the past 49 years. Support from the Provost's Office at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and the Graduate School at UWM are also both critical to our continued function. This year, the conference has also been supported by the UW System William F. Vilas Trust. We thank Kumkum Sundari for making this possible. Finally, to some people in the room. The center's staff has played key roles in making this event come about. Leila Saburi, are you here, Leila? Is she here? Oh, she's up there, there she is. Um, that's right, she's, she's doing the, the audio here. Um, the center's project assistant, who has not only coordinated a large degree of the conference, but also corralled a number of graduate students to volunteer. Let's give her a hand behind the glass. Thanks as well to those graduate students who are giving their time and effort to all of us. I'd like, not only, I'd like to not only thank them right now, but to ask you to please recognize their contribution throughout the conference. We're grateful to Cami Thomas, who recently joined the center in the midst of the tumult of the, of the conference planning. Cami's in back there. And to Ali Sperling, who set up its potential but then wisely left. John Bloom both oversees the material aspects of the conference, the wonderful posters, the program, and the book which will emerge from it, and the digital component, the filming and media elements, which some of you have already likely been appreciating. John, are you here? Could you stand up? And finally, I want to express my gratitude to Cal Heck, who's been indefatigable in his role as deputy director, communicating with many of you, coordinating hotels, and dealing with the indecipherable paperwork prerequisites, all while defending his superb dissertation and being hired by the University of Redlands. Cal is also in that. A uh, few bits of scheduling information before we start. Uh, once I'm finished here, I'll allow everybody about five minutes to go get a cup of coffee. And then I will invite up Greg Jay from UWM's English department to introduce our first plenary speaker, Frank Wilderson III. After this question and answer uh, session and the presentation, we'll cross the street out there, which for this conference is appropriately named Downer Street. Um, and we'll have an opening reception at the restaurant Sala. You're all invited to that. Uh, for any of you who are, who are here for the conference and are staying downtown, there will be a shuttle bus that will be leaving from Sala at 7.15. I'd also like to mention that these plenary sessions are being live streamed, uh, that the Twitter hashtag is hashtag C21BigNo. That's in the front of your program for those of you so inclined to such media. And finally, that individual video recording is not permitted. So, welcome to three days of naysaying, of whatever kinds emerge. We've come from four continents, many states and countries, and diverse and profoundly different disciplines to gather and, both together and against one another, to say no. Thank you. So please have a little coffee. We'll, get, we'll uh, reconvene here in five or ten minutes and uh, begin. Thank <laughs> you.